Hello. Today we're talking about game inside games, not game compilations or mini games. Specifically, full games inside of other games as like an extra bonus that you can unlock. The first thing you kind of get out of here. Oh, I got it. One. <laughs> Surprisingly, developers have been putting games inside of other games for generations. Like at the start, how many games were there that you could actually put into another as a bonus? According to some websites, Electro Cop for the Atari Lynx in 1989 was the first game to ever include another game as an unlockable. For the life of me, I cannot find out what that game was, however. All I can assume is that these websites are gross, disgusting liars. A few years later, the first real game to do this was Manic Mansion Day of the Tentacle for personal computers, a sequel to a game called Manic Mansion. Who could have seen that coming? You could play the entirety of Manic Mansion and the sequel on a computer. It's like if you were to play Metal Gear Solid 2 inside of Metal Gear Solid 3, for example. This game had an interesting development team, that being LucasArts, so that's already a good sign, and it was directed by Dave Grossman and Tim Schafer, who are better known for working at Telltale and creating Double Fine, respectively. So thanks for pioneering in the point-and-click adventure genre and this because now developers throwing in random games from the past are now more common. The most recent example I can think of is Street Fighter 6 including multiple of Capcom's arcade games like the original Street Fighter and Final Fight, but that's nowhere near the only one. So how about we go over some more interesting ones? Now, I may be the PlayStation guy, but let's start out easy with a Nintendo property, Animal Crossing, the life simulator where you have humanoid animals as your townmate. I'm not a furry, so I don't get any of this, but I do understand when there's a great deal, however. I got these shoes at a thrift store, so you know I'm not screwing around. And in the original Animal Crossing for the GameCube, you can unlock multiple NES games to play at your leisure. These include all-time gems like Balloon Fight and Excite Bike. A total of 19 games can be attained here, although some of them cannot be obtained without cheat devices. But you're not some dirty fucking cheater, are you? It's actually quite fitting for this type of game. Sometimes you just need to unwind from the stresses of everyday life with a little game of Super Mario Bros. That's especially apparent when you got Tom Nook breathing. Tom Nook. <laughs> That's especially apparent when you got Tom Nook breathing down your neck, just like in real life. I suddenly don't feel safe anymore, so I'll just leave it at this. Tortimer seems like an absolute bro. Well, speaking of turtles, here is Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle 3, Mutant Nightmare for the PlayStation 2. This game is bad. Of course, I've never actually played it, I'm just going off the critic reviews, which is how I judge games, just like a real gamer. Anyway, and here Turtles in Time is unlockable, which in case you didn't know, is a 2D side-scrolling beat-em-up arcade game released in 1991. It has since been ported many times, but at the time of 2005, this was the easiest way to play it, unless you had a Super Nintendo Entertainment System and a copy of the port. It is a beloved game in the genre according to the fans, which I for one have to agree with, even though I've never played it. That brings us, as everything does, to Pac-Man. This old boy right here knows how to provide a good extra. Look towards Pac-Man World 2. Once you get enough of these brown Namco tokens, you can unlock a variety of games throughout Pac-Man's history. Pac-Man, Pac-Attack, Pac-Mania, and Miss Pac-Man. These serve as good side rewards that encourage exploration of levels by way of finding these tokens, as they are often hidden in pretty obtuse locations most of the time. Although I don't know if I would ever consider Pac-Mania worth the effort. I'm sure I just pissed off somebody in the audience. Then there's everybody's favorite N64 game, Donkey Kong 64, where you can play the original Donkey Kong in Rare's own jetpack, whatever that is. Do I have to explain who Rare is for the three people who don't know? Nah. They can stay in the dark. The only fact that you need to know is that back when Jetpack was released, they were known as Ultimate Play of the Game. Now I feel bad for all the people in the 80s expressing their enjoyment for their games. Who's your favorite developer? Oh, it's gotta be Capcom. No, it's definitely Konami. Both of you guys are chumps. It's obviously Ultimate Play of the Game. And they look at you like you're a fucking idiot. Unlike the last few games, however, this isn't just a fun little bonus for when you get tired of trying to grab all the trillion collectibles in this game. Donkey Kong 64 forces onto you the task of beating these two games from the early 80s to finish the game. Not 100 complete the game, just to finish it normally. This is why I'm too scared to start playing this game. I don't know about you, but I have loved ones to see, things to do, places to see. I can't spend all my time trying to perfect Donkey Kong just to beat another game. I need to pursue what my soul is really telling me. Bam bam, I'm a samurai now. This is just a stake.
If you want to experience being a samurai without the environmental harassment, no treats were harmed in the making of this section of the video by the way, may I suggest the Ninja Gaiden reboot? You want to experience ninja action in two separate dimensions? With Ninja Gaiden you can have your cake and eat it too. In case you didn't get assaulted enough while playing the game, you can get even more in the original trilogy of side-scrolling action games that you unlock through some, frankly, obnoxious ways. I don't know how someone just randomly runs into the ways to unlock these games. If you are playing the original 2004 Xbox release, that is, because if you are playing any of the updated re-releases, Sigma or Black, that are included in modern collections, then you're actually playing the arcade version of Ninja Gaiden, which is a beat-em-up like Turtles in Time that I spoke about earlier. Now, why would they do this? I don't know. I'm not Tecmo. So in case you don't want to dish out a whopping 8 whole dollars to purchase the digital release on modern storefronts, you can do this instead. You know, in retrospect, I kinda like being in the pot. There we go. Much better. Since my little stint as a ninja didn't work out, how about we go Vampire with the Castlevania Dracula X Chronicles. This is a remake of the PC Engine game Castlevania Rondo of Blood, which was never released outside of Japan. Now, what's a PC Engine you might be asking? The PC Engine, otherwise known as the TurboGrafx-16, was a 16-bit console. The creation of the console was a joint collaboration between NEC, who are known for Japanese personal computers and are still around today, and Hudson Soft, who you may or may not know made Mario Party until Konami did their Konami things and Hudson ceased to exist. And its run from 1987 to 1984, it served as a good rival for the Super Famicom in Japan, where it sold well and had plenty of third-party games. So, why is this thing really talked about today among the 16-bit greats? With Nintendo already having success here and Sega having a certain blue hedgehog, there just wasn't enough room in our American hearts for another 16-bit console. That and the fact that the third-party support was much lower here compared to in Japan. Just go to the list of TurboGrafx-16 games on Wikipedia, sort the games by date release, and have fun scrolling until your finger falls off. But what's this section about again? Ah, uh, Dracula X. This being a remake, it's quite similar to the original, with some new added bells and whistles. With multiple new collectibles such as music discs that you can listen to, and included are the original PC Engine version, as well as Symphony of the Night. Now you might wonder what's the point of being able to play the original when the whole point of this game was to remake it. Probably because the remake is shit. I kid, I kid. Although I do feel there was something lost in the transition when it came to changing the 2D sprites into the world of 3D. Compare the stage from the original and its remake counterpart, and I think the difference is obvious. But that's just aesthetically speaking. In terms of gameplay, if you've played the remake, then you've essentially played the original. Just some new added content. Also, if you're familiar with the game, you might know that this game was advertised as a collection of Rondo of Blood and Symphony of the Night. Sure, you can perceive it as that, considering the back of the box is basically asking for it, but the fact that you have to unlock Symphony of the Night by playing through the Rondo of Blood remake far enough to unlock it, I consider this a game within a game. Plus, it was released on the PSP, so that's another knock against it as well. I actually recently bought a PSP, and if you're wondering if it was just for this video, then yes. The PSP is a PlayStation handheld console. Hey, here's another thing that's tangentially related to PlayStation. Crash Bandicoot. More specifically, Crash Bash. The mediocre at best party game. And the furry orange humans only attempt at one. And which game do you unlock Crash Bash in? Spyro Year of the Dragon, of course. Now, that may just say it's a demo, but don't be fooled. Due to the developer's lack of giving a shit, we can access everything that Crash Bash has to offer by putting the code on the title screen. This in turn unlocks the debug menu that gives us full reign to play any minigame we want. Now this right here, this is a real party. Once again, you're asking, should I really include this since technically it isn't supposed to be a full game that you can play with another? I say who cares? I mean if it's this fucking easy to do, how am I not going to at least mention it? I think it's about time I commit more treason, so how about I talk about some more Nintendo? There are many more examples I could point to in case. Nintendo is known for throwing random games where they don't belong. I mean, how many times have they put the original Mario Bros. arcade game in other Mario games? Each entry of the Super Mario Advance series has it. They gave it away so many times in other games that if you were ever had a desire to play it, put your hands between your couch cushions and you will find a way. The 2000s was a goldmine for this stuff, and the Game Boy Advance was a prime place for such an occurrence. Wait a minute. Prime? Metroid Prime, if you have a copy of that, and Metroid Fusion, and Game Boy Advance Link Cable, and a Game Boy Advance is pretty important, you can play the original Metroid by hooking the two up. So if you want to, you can consider this the most expensive way to play the first Metroid title. $100 for the GameCube, $20 for Prime, $70 for the GBA, $25 for a Link Cable, 
40 for Fusion, all from using general price charting and eBay prices. That's a whopping, wait a second, let me do the math, $255 Renos plus tax. There is a much more cost-effective way to play the beginnings of Metroid, like playing through Metroid Zero Mission. Okay, maybe it's not that much cheaper, but hey, it's easier than tracking down all that stuff and hooking it all up. All you gotta do here is finish the game and bam, you have it unlocked. But the same thing asked about Dracula X must be asked again, considering Metroid Zero Mission is a remake of the first Metroid, so why play it? In this case, I would say it's pretty much for history's sake. Being able to walk down memory lane and see how far the Metroid series had come up to that point. I know this wasn't from the 2000s, but there's the Game Boy Color version of Super Mario Bros. adding deluxe to the title, and deluxe it is. I don't own a whole lot of Game Boy games, but this one I do have, and it's a party. You against Boo, a calendar, hidden Yoshi eggs to find. There's so much extra stuff to mess around with that this really becomes the definitive way to play the original Super Mario Bros. But all these extras isn't what you came to this video for. The reason why this game's in this video is that you can unlock the Japanese version of Super Mario Bros. 2, known here as The Lost Levels. Because it was too hard, we got the game Doki Doki Panic, do I really have to explain any of this? But when there's a Game Boy version of another game, you know exactly where I'm going with this. Green Crunch. So this being the definitive way to play, may be a contentious thing to say. I can deal with it, I've been playing this version since I was very young, so it doesn't bother me, but I understand this is a deal breaker. A year later in 2000, however, on a different console, a different NES title, was given new life on a console with a number in the title, Excitebyte 64, on you guessed it, Commodore 64, Nintendo 64. It was the first game since the 1984 NES game, which was just existing, becoming one of the best selling games on the console. You know how it is. Kinda strange to see that there was no SNES game considering the success, but that's besides the point, because we have a new title using that naming convention that makes sense, but also doesn't if you have absolutely no context. Using these newfangled 3D graphics, ooh, having a camera behind the back invokes other dirt bike sports games, so it's definitely a different take compared to the original, unless you're playing the Excitebike 3D mode which is just 3D Excitebike, but not actually 3D Excitebike if you catch my drift. Heh, <laughs> drift, get it, get drift, get it, drift, do you, do you get it? And you can unlock, you know where this is going. But why play the NES game within 64? Well, if you want a real answer and don't just view this as a dumb extension on a lame joke that lost its luster one extension ago, then these are clearly different experiences, so one doesn't necessarily invalidate the other. You know, I think it's about time we end this video. There's plenty more I could talk about, but are you really hankering for the knowledge that the arcade splatter house can be played in the 2010 reboot of it? I already know the answer, so there's no point in responding to that question. I know you hunger for useless video game knowledge, while else would you be watching this? Well that was a fun little look back down memory lane. Too bad game developers don't feel the need to put these games inside of other games anymore. I guess there's no need to considering there's digital storefronts that they can put them on and cost like $8 a pop. Corporal Creed wins again. But now I kinda need to get out of here. Can you help me?